Thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you for the invitation and thank you all also. Um, so I, I'm going to present you some first results about the, uh, the possibility of earthquake, earthquake control. So um, the approach is, is theoretical and, ex and experimental. But before starting, I would like to invite you to play a game with me. So um, the game is the following. Just take a pen, find, grab a pen next to you. I took that one. And turn on your cameras. I would like to, to see you because it's very funny, this game sometimes. Just a so, second, I need to stand up and grab a pen then. <laughs> So try take this pen and try to stabilize it vertically like this by moving your hand. Try try to do this this test this game, and tell me if you manage. If you manage, uh, I will contact you immediately after this this meeting. So you see, it always drops. No, it is it is very very difficult. Uh, come on, yeah, you are cheating, Martin. <laughs> so the reason is that. This system is a, is a dynamical system, as all the systems that we uh, are living in, and it has two equilibria. The first equilibrium point is that one, when, the, when we, the pen is like this, and we see that if I do a small perturbation, it will go back to this equilibrium point, while if I hold it like this, this is the inverted pendulum, if I if I do a small, well, actually I cannot even equilibrate it as we we're seeing before, but this is an equilibrium point, but this is an unstable equilibrium point. That means that if somehow in a perfect world that there is no perturbations, we could put it in this vertical position, this could be an algorithm in the computer, for example, the minor perturbation, even 10 minus 15 numerical error, could make it flip to the other side. Now this problem has two degrees of freedom. It has the um, one, but it can be described by an ordered differential equation with two equations. It is non-linear too. And um, this, ordinal, this system of ordinal differ, ordinary differential equations have two unknowns. This is the, um, the rotational velocity and the, the angle. Now we'll show you another system that it is two um, it's made of two pens, it's um, the double pendulum, and this has four degrees of freedom. It is non-linear, and it is known for its chaotic uh, behavior. You see here an animation that I found on the, uh, on the web, on YouTube, and you see here in green the trajectories that this system follows in, uh, in space, and um, what we can see maybe not with this video, but you have to believe me or just search on the internet. If we perturb a bit or if we change a bit the initial conditions, then the trajectories that we will see will be totally different. This is um, intrinsic in systems that they show chaos. Of course, I'm talking about this because also faults can have very, very complex dynamics. And maybe the idea of control is quite ambitious, but I will show you an example of um, a double pendulum, the same one actually, that some researchers managed, they are not the only ones, managed to stabilize by applying a small torque here at the base. They managed to stabilize it in its vertical condition, despite its chaotic nature, the unstable dynamics and the non-linearities that, that this system has. This is the first example, but we know that earthquakes is a, a very, very complicated system. Um, so here you see um, the uh, photo of the Green Day Fault in New Zealand. That's spectacular. Uh, here it is. And you see that the, uh, we had a slip in this huge uh, area that extends for several kilometers. And the slip is equal to two units of trees. And if you uh, put some values and you back analyze, you can find also an estimation about the magnitude of this earthquake that, if I remember well, was around five, seven in, uh, in, um, uh, in New Zealand. Um, and if we zoom, what happens inside a fault is very, very complicated. We have um, um, a, a very thin zone that we many times call gouge. And it's composed of very fine crust particles. There we have multi-physics couplings, 
we have um, uh, th temperature, fluid pressure, chemistry, um, a, a broad distribution of fractality in terms of grains, and very complicated phenomena that take place. But these complicated phenomena are the phenomena that we finally uh, shape the upper friction of, uh, of a fault. Then around it, you have a, a, the damage zone, which has a thickness of some meters to can be of the order of kilometer, that it is the, um, let's say, first layers of the horse rock that because of the sliding can be, um, can be damaged. And this shows us a very, very complicated system that at first sight, it might be impossible to tackle with. And um, uh, at least we have to understand it a bit, a bit further. But you know, as as Popper, as Popper, the philosopher, um, was saying, science may be described as the art of systematic oversimplification. So instead of getting into the details in, the, in this presentation of friction of uh, the rocks or fluid diffusion, I would like to step back a bit and propose, or propose actually, use a contextual model and. Um, uh, remind what qualitatively finally an earthquake is. Of course, in the in the group that I talk, you you know uh, even better for me what an earthquake is really really is. But practically, we want really really to simplify. Let's say try to talk to uh, a non-specialist in order to make uh, him understand somehow what earthquakes are uh, and how they are caused. Is that Due to the far field tectonic displacements, we have the accumulation of huge amounts of energy in the rocks that they surround a fault. Now, as these displacements evolve with time, we have this energy that increases and increases. And if a condition, an instability condition is met, then suddenly this energy will be released in the environment. We will have an instability. In terms of mathematics, it will be a dynamic instability. And we will have um, a small portion of this energy that will travel to the surface and will destroy our infrastructure. It can create tsunamis, um, even if it is just some percentage of the total energy that was stored in the Earth in the in in uh, the Earth's crust before the event. Now we can go a step further and have a reduced order model in our in our in our heads in order to to allow us to think. Um, in, in, simple, uh, in a simple manner. And this is in the literature and in seismology in the earliest uh, years was the spring slider model. So we can simplify the previous, the previous system that you see, and we can add a spring here that it will be, uh, it will represent the, uh, the uh, elasticity of the surrounding uh, rocks to a fault. We can keep the fault and it's very complicated behavior, or we can simplify it also. And we can, uh, replace the uh, the um, the mass that was mobili mobilized and deformed before with a with a rigid block um, connected with the spring in this way, and we can in order to simulate the far field tectonic displacements we will just uh, pull the edge of the spring very very slowly. Now, uh, if we write down the equations of this simple system, uh, then um, we would have a, an ODE that would have the acceleration term, as you can see here, described in terms of the slip. It would have uh, the mass, the mobilized mass, that would be proportional to the volume that it is mobilized during the slip. It would be, um, uh, the right-hand side would have the friction that can depend on the slip, on the slip rate, on time, on multiphysics, whatever you want, you can put it in here. We would have the spring that represents the, um, the surrounding rocks. It is inversely proportional to the length of the fault and proportional to the uh, shear modulus. And we could also we could add also a, a viscosity term if we want. So um, this is a very simple system that um, can allow us to do some some analysis, and we can prove mathematically or also using physical arguments that. If we simplify a bit even more the system and we take the friction to depend only on the slip, in this case, we can find that an unstable event will happen as far as soon as the weakening of the friction that you see here with solid line is higher than the negative slope of the spring. 
that means conceptually that there is a region that might be small, but there is this region that can allow us to sustain creep-like, slow sleep, a, a seismic, stable uh, dynamics uh, in the system. However, if we go further than this point here, then we have an unstable event, we have a, a dynamic instability in terms of mathematics, and we'll have seismic sleep. Well, of course, this is a simplified model, that, but allow us a bit to see that there might be a window inside there where we could sustain a creep-like slow a seismic sleep. Now, what happens is that we know nowadays we have a lot of um, in situ experience compared to, I don't know, 40 years ago, uh, about the effect of fluids uh, in, um, in, in, in fault reactivation and the uh, triggering or inducing this kind of um, earthquake-like instabilities. But again, we can simplify the system and we can schematically show that when we inject fluids here, we increase the pore pressure in, in the fault zone. And as such, we will reduce the normal effective force or stress that is developed at the fault level. And as such, the friction would be reduced if we increase the pressure or increased if we reduce the pressure. Well, this could be quite, um, let's say, um, uh, alerting when we do projects uh, like geothermal, in deep geothermal projects or in, um, uh, in oil extraction or in CO2 storage, name it, there are a lot. But maybe it could be also a way to have an input and interact with the system. For instance, as I was saying before, when we increase, uh, when we inject fluids, of course, we will reduce the friction. But on the other hand, due to the multiplicative contribution of the fluid pressure uh, to the friction, we might ductilize the system, make it more ductile, meaning that we might make the slope at the post peak smoother. This gives us the idea of, well, maybe by modifying by fluid injections or using other stimulating techniques, we could modify the friction and have access to the system. And instead of uh, have it being brittle, maybe make it more ductile. In other words, maybe we could transform it from a brittle system. Here you see a six on the left to a ductile one. And on the right, there is a Mars chocolate. Well, th this is an idea that it is uh, that exists in the, uh, in the sphere of ideas um, that uh, would like first to explore. And um, what we did is that we did experiments in the laboratory using a surrogate material. Of course, uh, in your group, we have um, uh, we have seen from your group some very um, important and inspiring publications in um, in the field. But in the experiments I will show you, we said, what if we use a material and design in a simplified manner this mechanism of progressive release of the energy and uh, by ductilization of parts of a fault? To this end, we use paper towel or different kitchen paper. This is, um, this is a sheet of uh, kitchen paper. Um, I would like to say that we tested different papers and the best one was that one from this brand, OK, that's a French, a French brand that you maybe use already. And um, the idea for the kitchen paper comes from the fact that when you take it and you play with your hands, you will see that if you wet it, it becomes softer to break it. Now, of course, going to the lab, we went to a press and we did traction tests. So you see here uh, the setup, it is very simple. We just, um, with some grips, with, we, cut a, uh, we cut a stripe of this paper and uh, with, with grips, we fixed it to the press and we applied a, a, um, a traction load. Now, this is the response. Here you see the dry, the dry experiment. And here you see the behavior, the, the force paper displacement response when it is wet. Well, what it is nice is that you, first of all, you see that when you wet the, the paper, 
the dry paper, you have a, a force drop, which could correspond to the stress drop when we inject fluids in, um, in, um, in a fault. This seems like being an analogy, but on top of that, what you may also see is that there is a post peak slope in the dry paper that is not very, very, very steep. The, the slope here is uh, minus four. And this slope becomes uh, smoother when you wet it. Now it is uh, more or less four times less. Which also, it is a characteristic of the upper end friction due to the Terzaki stress when we inject fluids in the, um, uh, in, in the, in the vicinity of a fault. Okay, this is a simplified model, but it gives us some, maybe some, uh, a way to test some, some basic strategies of uh, earthquake control based on the idea that we will release the energy progressively and also that we will exploit the idea of satisfying, at least in parts of the fault, the, um, the stability condition um, that I showed you earlier. Now, we continue with this experiment and uh, in order to take into account the elasticity and consequently the elastic energy that is stored in the surrounding rocks, we added two springs. Then uh, we apply the far field tectonic displacement by emulating it with um, the, the traction displacement of the press. And here the, uh, the, um, the paper plays the role of the friction of the fault. Of course, now we have a mode one rupture and we will have it. But energetically, we can make this two, uh, the dynamics of these two systems of the spring slider that I showed you before and of the paper to be equivalent. And for this purpose, we imply some uh, scaling clause. I show you um, a, simplify, a simplified version of this scaling clause. Uh, oops, there's a problem here. No, no, sorry, I will go here. I don't know why this is happening. You see here, the, um, we, we connect the, um, the stress drop in the real system uh, and the uh, fault model with a coefficient. We bridge also the length scales, also with a coefficient. And as a result, the stiffness and the softening are also connected. And uh, if we do a bit of algebra, this will be, um, we can also connect the time scales between the two models and continue this algebra by measuring the energy that is released due to the um, rupture of the paper uh, can be related with the magnitude of, um, of uh, an earthquake in a, uh, in, in a real fault in the sense of, uh, of the spring slider model that I showed you before. Uh, this, you can find more details in a, in a paper published recently in, uh, in GRL. And now we'll go directly to the experiments. Now we take this small stripe and according to our scaling clause, we can have, um, uh, we can emulate, simulate an earthquake 4.5. You saw that this was quite energetic on the left. The videos started in the same time. And on the right, you see the behavior of the wetted stripe. And it is really, really slow, but you will see the, uh, the, the gradual development of some, um, of some cracks here that they propagate inside the paper. You see, you have a kind of shearing here that takes place. And, um, and finally the system uh, breaks, but we don't see any dynamic event as you saw in the, in the left experiment. So this practically validates experimentally what we would expect from this kind of model. And we can also measure here on the left, you see the force in terms of the paper displacement. And this is the released energy that we can measure. In red here, you see the velocity that was developed during, uh, that was measured during the dynamic instability that you saw before. And here is the, um, the displacement that with the scaling clause can be uh, attributed to, um, to, to, the, to the sleep of an equivalent uh, fault system. Now, if we check the same behavior of, for the wetted system, we see here that the velocities are practically zero. Everything is very slow, boring. Uh, actually, the target of this uh, whole uh, research is to make an, a phenomenon that is very, very interesting, dynamic to very boring one that evolves very, very slowly. So, uh, and here you see the displacements that they evolve very, very slowly as well with the dotted line. 
And this is, um, so finally we managed to avoid this, uh, this sudden instability by wetting the paper. But this was a very small fault area and we wanted to go to something that's bigger. So the idea here is to segment, to segment the whole fault area in smaller pieces, in zones. These are uh, some ideas also that we find in, uh, in recent works in the uh, recent works in the literature. They talk also about uh, fault caging, but um, what we do here is we just take this, uh, this system, imagine that you have uh, several wells, so like this, and we can inject fluids in each one uh, of these zones. Uh, the setup is more or less the same, so you have a spring that represents the, uh, surrounding, um, the surrounding rocks, their elasticity, we apply a far field uh, tectonic movement, and we start wetting the stripes one by one. And uh, this is what the experiment shows. Now the scaling clothes are for a 6.5, 6.5 kilometers uh, fault. And you see how it, bam, it explodes directly. And on the left, you will see that we'll do the same experiment, the same, we apply the, the same velocity, but at the 20% of the rupture force, we start injecting Um, injecting fluids, as you see here, the red line uh, signifies where the um, this uh, blue scotch was at the beginning, and we see that each time that we spray it, we um, increase uh, the displacements. And if I wait a lot, you will see that we don't have a rupture at all. The video though takes two minutes, and I want I don't want to to spend all the time um, uh, showing this, but we can come back if you want at the end, the questions. But um, we don't have the abrupt rupture that you saw on the left. Now let's see what the measurements show. On the left, you have the force um, in terms of the paper displacement. And this is the energy that we measure that is released uh, when we have the unstable event. Here is the uh, velocity pulse that we measure. And this is the slip. With the scaling close, we can refer it to, we can make, uh, we can refer these measurements to a real fault, at least in average sense over the whole fault area. Now let's see what it happens when we inject the, um, when we spray the papers and we wet uh, each segment of the fault. You see that the, always the, the hot areas are in red, they represent the, um, the energy that is released. And you see here, uh, the first one, the first one we spray in the first one, this could correspond to a, a smaller earthquake of 3.9. Then the second again to 3.9, then 4.3, then a 4.4, and finally 4.7. So we managed when we started injecting at this um, at this level of stress inside the fold, we managed to release this energy, the almost all the energy that was inside the system. We managed to release it progressively, and instead of having a 5.9 uh, earthquake, we had a 4.7 one, at least paper quake. So what happens if we now, though, we increase the in-situ stress level? So instead of starting at 20% of the rupture one, we inject, we start injecting at 60%. In this case, we would have a paper quake that would correspond to a 4.7. Then we would have a smaller one, 3.5. But then we would have a, a very energetic big one that would correspond to 5.5 and would correspond to also to the tearing of the whole paper um, and the development of very high velocities that would correspond to, to, to this uh, kind of magnitude. That means that the in-situ stress level plays a very important role and we did for different stress levels the same experiment. And the 20% and 40%, we had a 4.7 and 4.8 all injections could be completed and we didn't have the big one, the 5.9 reference earthquake. But if we go more than 50%, let's say it's 60 or 80, then we have an equivalent magnitude of 5.5 or 5.8 um, uh, dynamic events that they are developed. So the first important parameter is the in situ stress level. Another one, also, because this experiment allowed us allowed us to go a bit further and influence and um, examine the influence of other factors, like for example the number of segments 
that we do uh, over the fault area and the segment activation rate, meaning how how fast we inject, we we spray the the stripes, um, and um, based on some uh, simulation and uh, a simplified model that represents these dynamics, we could have these contour these contour plots, and we see that if we increase the number of the segments, we manage to um, move on the right on this diagram, meaning that we can mitigate, attenuate the maximum earthquake event uh, to for one or even more uh, than one uh, magnitude. And the same if we, um, if we increase the segment activation rate, we can again uh, reduce the maximum uh, paper quake event. Now the same happens in the uh, when we have uh, 60%. But you see that this red region is much bigger than the red region of the 20% um, because we're closer to the stability point of, of, this, um, of this system. And um, the red region corresponds to magnitudes that they are uh, very, very close to the reference 5.91. Now, okay, these are... It depends how we see the uh, the things. We can see the, um, the glass half empty or uh, half full. So if we sum up this uh, paper towel experiment, it was quite instructive. By playing with paper quakes, we managed to reduce it, to reduce the magnitude from 5.9 to 4.7. And under some conditions, we could reduce it even more. We identified three parameters. These were that they were very important. It was the in-situ stress level, the number of segments, and the segment activation rate. And we also observe that previous small earthquakes do not guarantee that a bigger one won't occur in the, in, the, in the future if we continue the injections. So the idea of progressive energy release seems to be kind of attractive. Um, and I'm saying the uh, progressive energy release in combination with satisfying this stability condition per segment in the, um, in the fault area. But on the other hand, if we look more carefully, the problem is that we, do, we need to know the exact in-situ stress before doing the injections. This is practically impossible um, in practice. If the in-situ stresses are higher than, let's say, 50% uh, of the maximum one, consider that we could know it somehow, nothing can be done with this approach. It will go to, uh, to instability. If on top of that, we put numbers to the equations, we'll see that in most of the cases, the fluid pressure that we have to inject and increase, it is almost equal to the in-situ stresses. If one wants to cancel out the instability conditions uh, with a sleep weakening or with the rate and state uh, low, you will find more or less the same conditions. The properties of the friction also, the properties of the system also are not known. The friction, as we said in the beginning, is something that's very, very heterogeneous, very hard to grasp and we just know some rough bounds of it. So the idea of releasing the energy slowly, finally, it's not so promising, or at least for, for kitchen paper. This brings me to, um, to, the second top of, to the second part of this presentation, because you know, if, um, uh, if we cannot really control the system, this means that many of the uh, active industrial projects might not be feasible at all. And we have many examples. I will cite uh, the example of Pohang. I will cite the example of the old one in Switzerland, Bezel, uh, recently in Strasbourg, in Oklahoma. We have many examples where we see that fluids finally induce or trigger earthquakes. So the approach that we follow in my group is also based on mathematics. And we used the, um, what is called the, the mathematical theory of control. The idea of the mathematical theory of control, it's relatively easy. You have a plant, here it is, which in our case is the physical process of earthquakes. And you have, you will try to design a controller, here you see in red, in such a way that it will adjust the input, the plant to the physical process that in, in our case, in the examples presented here is the fluid pressure, in such a way to achieve an output here denoted with a Y, that it is behaving as you want. You want, for example, to achieve a creep-like, a seismic sleep. So we'd like to have 
the output of the system that to, to be the sleep and you want it to be very, very slow or you want to fix a constant velocity or you want to, uh, to um, uh, prescribe a velocity or a displacement for the system to, fall, to, to follow. So for this, you need to design a controller and a controller cannot always be designed. There is a, a specific class of systems that can be controlled. And this has to do with the physical process. The system has to be stabilizable and controllable in order to be able to design a controller and then uh, achieve uh, stabilization or uh, achieve tracking. Tracking means that we want to control the evolution of the output and in an optimal and, in an optimal and robust uh, uh, way. Now, I will go back to the spring slider because it's a very good uh, conceptual model that has many of the uh, characteristics of the, of the real system. And we can, uh, basing on um, a double asymptotic approach and um, some uh, mathematical operations, and then a Laplace transform, we can calculate the, um, the transfer function of, of the system. Now, the transfer function of the system relates the output of the system, which can be the sleep, with its input, which is the fluid pressure. And there is a very interesting theorem that shows that if there are no decoupling zeros in the closed right half, right half complex plane, then the system is stabilizable. Well, in other words, decoupling zeros are the uh, roots of this polynomial here, n, and of this polynomial here, d. They should not have um, common roots, and these roots, they should not be, they should not have a, a positive real part. Well, the nice, the good news is that this system has indeed, uh, does not have decoupling zeros, and that means that it is stabilizable. This means that it's a rigorous mathematical result that shows us that there exists always a way to inject fluids that can indeed stabilize the system and prevent a seismic event. And just I will do a small parenthesis here. I don't refer to um, satisfying the instability slash stability conditions that we're showing before, because this is impossible if we want to do it, because we need to apply an infinite rate uh, in order to reach this. This uh, mathematical result shows us that just there is a way to inject fluids. But how? I won't get into the details to show you uh, different versions of the controllers that were, um, that were designed. I'll show you directly uh, some results. Now, the first application could be for avoiding induced seismicity. Now imagine that you have a deep geothermal plant and you, uh, there is a fault length somehow that is uh, equal to approximately 500 meters. And the engineers have decided in order to assure production that they want to increase the fluid pressure with a specific rate um, uh, in, uh, in some time, uh, in some given time. And they start injecting fluids and they increase the pressure, they increase the pressure, they increase the pressure. But in the same time, the controller started listening and uh, controlling the system. But it would respond. You see here, the engineers decided to increase, increase, increase the pressure, but the controller was listening and without knowing the instability uh, point of the system, automatically it capped, it stopped the pressure increase and stabilized the system. And you see here that this is the point that this happened, that was unknown to the controller. And you can see also that then the fluid pressure continues to evolve, but there is a, a very slight slope, uh, negative slope. So the controller uh, progressively reduces the fluid pressure in order to avoid instability. And in this case, the system uh, is, a, is on the verge of instability. That means that if we deactivate the controller, then it will go dynamic, we'll have a, an earthquake event. This, behind the simulation, there was always, there's always the spring slider. I will show you a more complicated example in some slides from now. So an earthquake happened. And another example is to drive a system to lower stable energy states. Now we could take a bigger fault, let's say five kilometers. And uh, if we leave it alone, then um, we will have uh, the, uh, the upper, uh, sleep over the fault surface, we would have the uh, development of velocities that were that the order of some meters per second, 
And if we do this um, uh, simple, uh, simplified scaling, uh, sorry, um, calculating the seismic moment, um, with these scalings, we would see that this uh, uh, dynamic event corresponds to, a, to an earthquake of magnitude 5.8. Now, what we will do is to, instead of leaving the system to go un unstable, we'll start, we'll activate the controller just before uh, its instability point. And we will say to the controller, drive the system with a constant velocity that it is at least, let's say, three orders of magnitude lower in the numerical um, calculations and simulations that I will show you in the next slide, we apply a velocity that is equal to eight, centim eight centimeters per minute. And what we expect from the controller is to adjust automatically the fluid pressure in order to assure this creep-like slow sliding. And this is what it gives. On the left column, you have the control system, and on the right system, you have the natural one. The controller succeeds in applying a constant velocity. This is why the uh, displacement evolves linearly with time. We could also put a sigmoid uh, curve if we would like, or we could make it doing oscillations. We can do whatever we want, actually. But in this example, we apply the constant, a constant velocity, which is equal to 8, centim eight centimeters per minute. And then we can calculate the kinetic energy that it is at least four orders of magnitude uh, compared to the kinetic energy that was developed during the unstable abrupt event. So you see that with the controller, we can adjust, actually, the controller that is designed for this can adjust automatically the fluid pressure and can render the system from unstable to stable and also it can do tracking, asymptotic tracking. It can apply a constant velocity or any other trajectory that we want. But let's see how finally it managed to do this. This is the fluid pressure that the, um, that the controller finally calculated and regulated automatically. When I had this result, I was a bit surprised in the beginning. I, I have to, to be honest, because I was expecting to uh, regulate the pressure in a sense that will go towards satisfying the, uh, the, uh, the stability condition of the system. But this is not the case. Actually, the controller inject of, instead of injecting and increasing the pressure, it reduced the pressure. It pulled water, it pumped water out from the system. And we see here the evolution of the fluid pressure uh, with respect to time. The time is normalized. The time is not a... a it's a design parameter that will have to do with the, the capacity of the pumps, but uh, it's, it's a free parameter in, 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 this, um, in this problem. And we see finally that it applies suction. Then, but finally, when I, I thought it a bit more, I, I saw that, yes, because the system was at the verge of instability at this point. So if we reduce the friction, then we'll go faster. It will be more unstable. While if we increase the friction, then somehow we hold it. It's like hitting the brakes in, um, in, in your car instead of uh, accelerating when you have an obstacle in front of you. Okay. But now this was a simple model. It was a spring slider. The friction was a slip weakening low. Uh, we didn't have a lot of uncertainties. Actually, we didn't, in these examples that I show you, the uncertainties were zero. So the question inevitably is what happens if there are a lot of uncertainties in the system. If we cannot, uh, as it is in practice, that we don't know the friction, uh, the dynamics of the system are more complicated than the uh, simple dynamics of the spring slider. So let's add some complexity and uncertainties. We know that from the literature, the, uh, the whole class of Barrett's uh, Knopf uh, models, so criticality, self-organized criticality, they show chaos, and they have some similarities with faults. Actually, by reading the, the literature, we see that the dynamics of the Barry's knob of models are richer than the dynamics of, of a fault when we uh, discretize it, when we discretize the differential operator. And um, but exactly when we discretize the differential operator that uh, governs the evolution of a fault, you can choose the method that you want. Finally, we come up to a system of this form. And all the system could share the same mathematical form in their discretized version 
of a system ordinary, of ordinary differential operation of operate uh, ah, sorry of ordinary differential equations where the right hand side will depend on x that can have the slip the uh, the slip velocity it can the, it can have the fluid pressure it can have also temperature it can have the state if we use the um, rate and state uh, friction law and all these parameters if we don't model these dynamics explicitly, we could put it, we could put them in the time t. Now, doing some maths that I will skip for now, but I would be happy to, to discuss with you later if you want. What we have uh, shown is that if the friction coefficient is Leipzig continuous with respect to the states of the system that are related to the dynamics, this is the, uh, the slip and the slip uh, rate. Uh, you see here that the friction can depend directly on time, but if it is Leipzig, meaning that it um, satisfies this inequality here, if on top of that the friction has a lower bound, meaning that it does not go to zero, and if the elasticity and viscosity tensors of this, oh, sorry, elasticity and viscosity yes, tensor parameters of the surrounding rocks are bounded, and if the diffusivity has a lower bound that's greater than zero, then we can design an output feedback stabilizer controller and we can achieve asymptotic tracking. In other words, despite of the uncertainties, the, despite of the connectivity matrix, despite of the elasticity, if these bounds exist and they exist for, for, um, for all the, um, the friction loads that we have, in this case, we can make the system behave in a way that we want and achieve tracking, meaning impose, for example, a constant velocity or a sigmoid slip or whatever. Now, I will show you an example. I will start with the risk dynamics of the Barry's knopov model. Just for a sanity check, I reproduced in the computer some simulations and we see here this uh, uh, devil staircase. You can have periods of quiescence that nothing happens, that they are followed by uh, many cascade events that correspond to the, uh, to the sliding of groups of these blocks. And just for sanity check, if we plot the uh, statistics of, um, of this model, it verifies what we see in the literature, which is the, um, which is the, uh, the power law. Now, this system is very, is very demanding. And for the simulations, I consider a slip weakening uh, friction law in, uh, in the masses here. And um, let's see what could happen if we um, uh, try to control the system. And I took, as initial conditions, I put the simulation exactly here. So if I left the system, I would have a, a very energetic uh, dynamic event that would involve 12 blocks. And um, I activated the controller with a target to uh, achieve a velocity that is small and constant to uh, and smaller three orders of magnitude lower than the maximum velocity that was uh, reported in the uh, dynamic event. And in this case, oops, there is a problem, I don't know why. And in this case, you see that the, uh, the controller achieves to um, uh, impose this uh, average velocity that's three, three orders of magnitude lower than the maximum one. You see the velocities of the blocks that they evolve in a, in a way that finally the dynamics of the system coupled with the controller decides. This is the evolution of the slip with the black lines. And this is the uh, fluid pressure that was automatically regulated by the controller. You see in some blocks, the fluid pressure had to be smaller, while in some others, it had to be uh, higher. And after a point, all the blocks were needing to, um, to have, um, uh, to inject, a, uh, to increase the fluid pressure at their, at, their, um, at their interface, which means that the system is now in a, in a stable state and we can deactivate the controller. And indeed we deactivate the controller here. And then uh, of course, the, the, uh, gradually we uh, send the pressure equal to zero. And you will see here that the velocity of all the blocks becomes almost equal to zero, practically equal to the external far feed velocity. And you see that the friction, the energy, the potential energy here in the black line, it is equal to the energy that is debated due to friction at the basis of the block and the interfaces of the block. So the kinetic energy is practically zero. So we don't have any more 
any unstable events, and we drove the system in a stable equilibrium point where we could deactivate the controller. Now, the next example is to show you an application after discretizing the um, continuous differential operator with the scenery approach. You can use other methods, uh, methods as well, maybe more exact. I know that you have very uh, developed tools in your group. And, um, but I will show you this, uh, this simulation with this approach that we discretize this differential operator of elastodynamics. We put a teach, we discretize the fault in small, in small pieces, uh, respecting the condition for the uh, nucleation length and discretization. And at each point, we use the different uh, parameter A, B, and B, C, obeying a log normal distribution. The constitutive law for friction was a rate and straight friction law. And we took into account also the um, uh, gradual increase of fluid pressure and the normal stress um, acting on the, uh, this uh, strike, uh, simplified strike slip configuration. And if you leave the system uh, free, this is the open loop without control, you see that you have um, big velocity, big, big rates that the large rates that they are developed of the order of 0 0.7 um, uh, point wise meters per second. And on the right, you have the, uh, the slip that is accumulated after leaving the uh, system to, to go unstable. And now we go and we apply the control. In these examples, we inject fluids at each point of the fault that you saw before with a pressure that is uh, defined by the controller. You will see here on top left that the velocities are very small because we prescribe the velocities and we say that we want to have a very slow creep-like uh, slip following the black curve that you see here. And finally, in this scenario, we will reproduce the slip that you saw before was the target of the simulation. And as far as it concerns the fluid pressure, this is the response of the controller. With blue, you see the average uh, pressure that is developed all over the fault area. And with the uh, shaded blue, the, um, the envelopes, well, in some cases it has to be negative, in some other it has to be positive. And here is the uh, contours, I mean, the, uh, the distribution of the fluid pressure all over the fault that has to be applied in this scenario in order to, um, to stabilize the fault. And here, this is a static image of the same thing. On the left, you have on average, the displacement, the slip rates and the displacements all over the fault. Here are the evolution on average of the rate uh, of the state parameter. Uh, here is the um, average slip rate that we impose with the, um, with the prescribed. Uh, here is the evolution of the pressures. Here is the open loop, the distribution of the velocities at point A that you see here, while here is the distribution of the velocities of the maximum velocities that were developed that were the maximum was two millimeters per second by design in this uh, analysis. In the analysis that I show you, we didn't take into account the, diffusi the diffusion processes. This is another work that we have already the results, but I won't speak uh, about this right now because we don't have a lot of time. Um, but I would like to summarize the key points. We proved mathematically that the system is stabilizable, also controllable and observable. We proved also mathematically that the system can follow asymptotic tracking without needing exact information about friction, the elastic parameters, the viscosity, the geometry, the tectonic setting, the normal stresses, uh, which shows the robustness of the approach to the, of the approach to unmodeled dynamics. And finally, we show that the system can indeed move as seismically with, desired, with the desired rates to a new stable equilibrium, provided that the controller is well designed or robust. And in this case, we could avoid, we could avoid earthquake-like instabilities. But all of this, at least in this uh, idealized environment, that is a numerical environment. So what in parallel we pursued uh, during the research was to be able to um, control uh, um, um, an experiment in the laboratory that represents uh, the earthquake instability. So there's, there are two experiments. I will show you uh, just a snapshot from the first one. Uh, this is a, a specifically designed uh, double sear like apparatus for uh, reproducing the instability, as you see here. The blocks, the specimens here, you see there's an interface here and another here 
the middle block, it is pushed through a spring in the system. The blocks are made by 3D printed, uh, by 3D printed um, uh, material with sand that has some very nice and exotic properties that they allow us to um, design the friction in, uh, in a way, uh, give us more flexibility in the, design, in the design of the frictional properties. But if we leave the system uh, without any control, then we'll see these very nice uh, instabilities that they are also periodic. Uh, but then we activate our control system that it is uh, achieved by this system here that uh, regulates the effective stress over the, um, over the interfaces according to the controllers that we have designed. And what we see in these experiments that the target is to falsify the theory uh, is that um, finally we managed to achieve in this experiment, in reality, in a, in a, in a quite robust way, a creep like a seismic slip uh, of, the, um, of the middle block. And of course, with some scaling clause, we can upscale and do um, some analogies with the prototype with a real fault system. Um, so just to conclude, the, the target of this project is to pose the question of earthquake control. And what I would like to know at the end of this project would be if it is finally possible or impossible. But I would like to have a, a specific answer, a concrete answer. If it is impossible, it's okay. If it is possible, it's also okay. But I would like to know finally where we are. Um, and for this, per for this reason, we need mathematics, we need, we need mechanics, we need physics, we need experiments, we need collaborations too. And, um, and with this, I would like to, to close uh, this presentation. I would like to thank you for your attention, but also thank the, uh, all the members of the group that they are directly, directly or indirectly involved in, this, um, uh, in these works. Thank you.